Coming up, we're visiting with the author of the award-winning book, Hashtag Indian Love Poems. Plus, a filmmaker tackles the tough issue of missing and murdered Indigenous relatives in a new PBS documentary. And we learn the details of police in Detroit breaking up an Indigenous sugarbush ceremony. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Kuwati Hopa. Thank you for joining us. As Russia continues to invade Ukraine, some Alaska natives are beginning to monitor the Arctic, which is home to many indigenous communities. At their closest point, Russia and the state of Alaska are just 55 miles apart. The body of water between the land bases is known as the Bering Strait. And in the Bering Strait are two islands. The Big Diomede is owned by Russia and Little Diomede is owned by the U.S., both are home to Siberian Yupik people. Over the last few years, Alaska natives say they have noticed an increased presence of the Russian military. Melanie Bonke spoke about this issue at the 2020 Alaska Federation of Natives Conference. She said in part, We are the eyes and ears on the ground. We're very close to Russia. We see what's happening. We see what boats that are going through our seas. As the tensions increase, many will closely watch Russia's next moves, especially as the country has proven it will take significant and dangerous risks, even ignoring international laws to achieve its goals. And you can read more of this reporting by visiting our website. Just search for the headline, Monitoring the Arctic and Russian Invasion of Ukraine. In Oklahoma, a Cherokee citizen has announced his candidacy for the U.S. Senate. Earlier this week, Senator Jim Inhofe announced he will be retiring early, spurring Republican Representative Mark Wayne Mullen to throw his name in the race. Mullen took to social media. I'm not one to back away from a fight. In fact, I believe 100 percent if you're going to get in the fight, you win it. So we're in it to win it. Thank you. May God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. Mullen is currently serving his fifth term in the U.S. House and is the vice chair of the Native American Caucus. The Republican Party is heavily favored to win this race as the state hasn't elected a Democrat to the post since the 1990s. The Republican candidates will first face off against each other in the June primary, and so far there are two Republicans running in addition to Mullen. In Northern California, three former officials of the Pasquenta Band of Nomaki Indians are going to jail after embezzling nearly $5 million from the tribe. 56-year-old John Crosby is a former FBI agent who was the tribe's economic development director. His mother, Inez Crosby, was the tribe's administrator, and his aunt, Leslie Lowe's, was the tribe's treasurer. Prosecutors say the trio took $4.9 million from the tribe to spend on fancy homes, cars, vacations, and other luxuries. In 2019, they pled guilty to the crimes, and earlier last month, a U.S. district judge sentenced them to a combined 13 years in prison. Crosby will have to serve his sentence and pay a $10,000 fine. The tribal nation has approximately 300 citizens, and its casino generates $100 million a year. Parades are returning to the Aruro Carnival in Bolivia. Thousands of colorfully dressed dancers and musicians kicked off celebrations in the Bolivian city in mid February. Parade goers say they missed their traditional celebration after it was canceled last year. Almost everyone in Oruro, a former mining center in western Bolivia, has a role as a dancer, musician, dressmaker, or makeup artist. One dancer talks about why he is motivated to take part in the celebration. 
We've got this illness in one moment or another, thanks to the mother of the mind who has made us reborn. This is the strength that she gave us to heal after our family has traveled on. And in their memory, we dance today. The United Nations World Heritage event has been celebrated since the 18th century. In Alaska, the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race is kicking off. 49 mushers are scheduled to compete in the premier race, including four Alaska natives. Pete Kaiser will compete. He was the first Yupik champion of the Iditarod in 2019. Competitors are racing on 1,000 miles of flatland tundra. The area has deep inclines and blizzard-prone summit passes, as well as frigid cold temperatures. The race is set to start on March 5th in Anchorage. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, an Indigenous author talks about how they blend humor and love into their poetry. But first, we explore a timely new documentary. Artist and activist and a politician tell their stories in a new documentary directed by Leah Hale. It is produced by Sergio Rapu, and Minnesota's TPT PBS station is presenting the film. Let's take a look at this clip. When Savannah LaFontaine Grewin went missing, it really hit home because it was an, a young Native American woman and working mom preparing for the arrival of their daughter. I didn't realize how traumatic that experience was, just helping with the search, until I drove to North Fargo one time. But yeah, this whole area was the search, the search headquarters. The family put a call to action on Facebook that week, and so everybody just showed up here. There was a young lady standing on top of one of those tables. She, I think she was an emergency management student. They had the map of the whole area. As soon as you got your search assignment, you just left. Everybody realized the sense of urgency. We were combing the river down here. So we did that till it got dark. I was asked by two women from Turtle Mountain if I would lead the search the following day. Leia is best known for her first feature documentary, The People's Protectors, which won the Upper Midwest Emmy Award for Best Cultural Documentary. And in 2020, Leia was awarded the Sundance Institute's Murata Mita Fellowship for Indigenous Artists. Bring Her Home has been selected to represent the U.S. in the prestigious Input Festival in Barcelona. Welcome to the ICT Newscast, Leia. Hello, everyone. My name is Leia Hale, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Your documentary follows three film participants. Tell us about some of them. Yes, the three film participants in my documentary, Bring Her Home, is Representative Ruth Buffalo from Fargo, North Dakota, but she derives from the three affiliated tribes, the Mandan, Hadatsa, and Arikara people. And the activist of the film is Misty Babineau from the Red Lake Nation. And the artist in the film is Angela Two Stars from the Sisseton, Wapiton, Dakota people. 
And um, I was very honored to have all three of them um, agree to participate in the film, um, to, to share their unique stories and empowering stories, especially when it comes to um, bringing awareness to the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic, and as well as um, showing us their experience in regards to um, making change in their communities. A lot of these sources looked at the stories of real life people and victims of MMIW. Tell us about some of them. Yes, I really wanted to try and get a range of different stories. Um, for instance, Angela Two Stars, her personal connection to MMIW is her grandmother was missing um, when she was nine years old and they unfortunately um, discovered her body. And I really wanted to uh, get um, a different, different perspectives and stories that are not just current, but stories that took place um, um, years ago and more contemporary stories such as the search for Savannah Greywind in regards to um, Representative Ruth Buffalo and her experience um, leading some of the search parties in Fargo, North Dakota when Savannah Greywind went missing when she was eight months pregnant. So I really wanted to, you know, demonstrate and show that this issue is not new, that this has been happening from for generations. And some may even say this has been happening since first contact um, in regards to just the mistreatment of our indigenous people, specifically our women. Leia, what did it mean to you on a personal level to work on this documentary? I can tell you as a journalist and a Native woman, it sometimes feels scary and heavy to think that I could be a victim someday. Um, so I'd like to ask you the same question. What does it feel like to work on a topic that sometimes is really heavy? Um, yes, I made sure that um, I was constantly, you know, reminding myself about the importance and the empowerment that would come from telling these stories. Um, so I made sure to not only protect myself and the film participants by utilizing traditional medicines such as Peji Hota Sage, um, which will you will see reoccurring as a visual motif throughout the film because I wanted to make sure that when we delve into some of these tragic stories of loss and pain that I wanted to, you know, have those traditional medicines available for our participants to make sure that we weren't re-traumatizing them while they told these stories. Um, and I also not only wanted to touch on these stories that are so painful, but I made it a point to also talk about the resiliency that are within these women, especially, and that are within our communities to really focus on um, a way forward and a way to search for solutions to this story as well, and to empower our communities to um, keep moving forward in a, in a positive way, but also um, remind us that we have this resiliency within us that we can tap into and that that will help us, you know, be more strong and um, and more, I guess you can say, um, to serve as examples for our community members. Leia, that's really beautiful, the way that you weave those core values into your film. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Neil K. Campbell is an author and photographer whose first book, Hashtag Indian Love Poems, focuses on love and lust in Indigenous communities. Tenille joins us today to talk about she, how she uses humor and storytelling to reclaim and explore ideas of Indigenous sexuality. Welcome to our show, Tenille. Thank you for having me. 
So first off, tell us about your book. What are some of the poems? What are some of your favorite poems in this book? <laughs> well, Nadina Zoo, which means good medicine in Dene, our language, um, is a collection of the funny stories that you tell your girlfriends on Saturday and Sunday night. And it's full of joy and laughter and complications. And I think some of my favorite poems have to be the ones where it's very self-deprecating. We laugh at ourselves for falling in love with the guy everyone loves. <laughs> you know, we fall in love with the bow wow dancer. We fall in love with the hockey player. And it's that celebration of we're all kind of fools in this idea of love and romance with just an indigenous flavor. A lot of the uh, themes of your poems have to do with indigenous sexuality and self-love. Um, tell us about some of those themes and why you choose to work um, in those themes. Well, both my books, Indian Love Poems and Nadine Zoo, came out of a space of, I'll say, emotional recovery from a long-term relationship. And I say this with so much love for myself, but after you break up, there's definitely a rebound stage. And I was at that point where I'm naturally a poet, and I was writing these things, and I was speaking to these truths that I think all women have, you know, exploring our body, exploring desire, exploring what that means with different people. And there was always like this pearl clutching going on. And I was like, why are we so ashamed to talk about our bodies and our pleasure and what we want? And finally, I just started writing these poems down. And it got to this point where combining Indigenous humor with this quest for sexuality, with this quest for knowledge and like body awareness, just kind of amalgamated into this beautiful little collection where, you know, women will send each other these poems online and like use them to pick up their med and I'm like I'm done I'm done good work this today <laughs> that's a great point it seems like from your following on social media there's a real thirst for this kind of poetry um tell us how you sort of use social media um to get your message across to other people well I love social media I'm definitely one of those online indigenous people and I found that using social media to kind of like the hashtags, indigenous, indigenous erotica, Indian joy, indigenous love, allows us to like search for those both positive stories and positive images about us and for us and by us. And I think that was really important in kind of building up this little online brand. So when the books came out, I feel like indigenous women and people just saw themselves in these stories and really connected to it. So it's really done well, both online and in person. What are some of your favorite conversations um, from the people who follow you about um, these poems? What are some of the favorite things that, you know, people tell you? You know, when you write about sexuality and you're so open about it, that like that barrier of like, oh, that first barrier is just gone. So people tell me so much truth when I first meet them. And I've heard about like boyfriends' preferences. I've heard about kinks. I've heard about desires before I even like learn their last name. And it's so funny because I'm all for it. Like, tell me your stories. But it's also like, wow, you went there. <laughs> so <laughs> it's wide and varied like Indigenous people are. That is so wonderful. Tanil, tell us about what upcoming projects you have and what you're working on right now. Well, I'm in my PhD at my local university in Saskatchewan, and I'm writing about Indigenous women's erotica in Canadian literature. And I'm really excited about that, kind of exploring about how we write about our body and how that heals us. And I think that's so important. And then on the creative side, um, I'm also a photographer, and I'm doing a photography on Indigenous desire through a female gaze. What do we consider desirable? what draws us in and so often it's not that stereotypical like six pack and chiseled jawline but it's chemistry and it's power and it's connection so what does that look like in a photograph so fun that's wonderful we'll definitely make sure um, to keep an eye out for that Tanil, thank you so very much thank you for having me and we'll be right back
Last month, an indigenous sugar bush ceremony was broken up by the Detroit Police Department in Michigan. The police apologized for the incident, but leaders of the group aren't happy and want bigger changes. We are joined now by ICT and underscore reporter Chris Adlin to talk more about what happened. Hi, Chris. Hi, Leah. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, so summarize the incident, what happened at a high level. Um, so yeah, so what the, the Sugar Bush Project, they've, they've been meeting now for about three years and, and it started, um, you know, as a way to bring community members and youth and, um, you know, Black and Indigenous people together um, to kind of learn about, uh, you know, learn about the land they live on and um, some of the, the Indigenous Anishinaabe um, and, and other tribal nations kind of, um, you know, what uh you know how they lived and and some of the practices they still are uh you know still practicing and um so uh they were meeting to uh meeting in the evening to uh for kind of a, a kickoff ceremony for the the sugar bush season and um you know there was a group there and they had a bonfire and um they were just kind of celebrating the, the start of the season and um uh, then they noticed uh, a police helicopter hovering overhead and soon, um, you know, police, uh, you know, over a dozen police were, were at the scene. And, um, you know, kind of what this boils down to, according to the group, is, you know, what one thing they're frustrated about is, is um, you know, they're saying this was, uh, you know, a huge miscommunication and a lack of communication on the part of the city and the police department and, and uh, other entities because, um, the, the group has, has been working with the city, um, all throughout and, and has, uh, MOUs in place and, um, you know, has, has partnered with the city on this. Um, and, uh, um, you know, what the, you know, the, the police eventually said was, um, that, uh, yeah, you might have this memorandum of understanding MOU, and, and permits, but uh, it's expired. So um, we are, you know, justified in, in, in breaking up this, this ceremony. And, um, and at the same time, they said that the, the group didn't have a permit for the bonfire that they're having for the, the ceremony. And so they have, um, well, apologizing for, you know, kind of the incident at the same time, defending their officer's actions because, you know, they, the MOU you know, wasn't valid. And, um, you know, that, uh, you know, they didn't intentionally break up a ceremony or, or spiritual event, because, you know, in their words, it didn't appear to be one. So I guess just so I'm understanding correctly, this was a group of people who were meeting to um, take part in a sugar bush, bush ceremony, and then the cops showed up and it seems like things escalated quickly because of what the cops are calling uh, a misunderstanding. Um, what did the what exactly did the police have to say um, in terms of the actual breakup of the ceremony? What were they telling to the participants? It, it sounds like, you know, at first um, they were they were pretty respectful. And then, you know, according to the group, there was one kind of group of, of police that were a little bit more threatening um, you know, intimidating, um, you know, saying, you know, if you don't leave within two minutes or three minutes, you know, we're going to arrest you. Um, and, you know, kind of disregarding the arguments that the group was making that, you know, they were exercising, you know, their, their religious rights and, and, and treaty rights. And, um, you know, there, there's one cop report is saying that, you know, your sovereignty, um, you know, essentially, we, we don't care about, you know, sovereignty, that doesn't matter here. Um, and so, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the, the participants and leaders of the, the ceremony said they felt quite threatened and intimidated. Um, and, uh, you know, that it didn't need to get to that point where you had over a dozen officers kind of marching into the woods and surrounding this, this group of, you know, youth, uh, you know, adults, indigenous leaders, elders, um, that were gathered there that it, it didn't need to get to that point. Um, so. And does the group have any plans to address this moving forward? You know, they're, they're still, they're still deciding last, uh, you know, last I spoke with them kind of how to proceed. Um, you know, they've, they are encouraged by kind of the support and reach out that they've gotten since then. 
and um, you know the they've been in contact with the police department and you know the police department has said they they hope to meet with the group at some point as well as you know the police department saying they plan to meet with others in the state um, you know lawmakers um, ACLU um, you know indigenous adv advocacy organizations and, and such um, you know and the the um, when this happened, the the group and the city were the group, yeah, the group and the city were in the process of finalizing an updated MOU. Um, so, um, so there's that. But as far as kind of what the group plans to do, they're still, um, you know, talking about how to how to move forward and what you know uh, to to do for some sort of statement, what that might say, and just you know what other kind of public advocacy or, or kind of public um, statements or events they might do in, in light of this but they're still planning to you know go ahead and and um you know collect the sap and turn it into sugar and and uh and syrup um i mean because the sounds like the sap is, is is running already if if not it's about to be so plan and go forward with that well this is a story we'll continue to watch thank you so much chris thanks leah and that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can Oh, you got to run, you got to run, you got to run.